Okay, this is the, the sermon today is called Stories Are Great. <laughs> Stories are great, it really is. Stories are great. Stories are great. I want to go to Mark chapter 3, verse 34. Amen. How many of you are reading? We're all reading. We, had to buy, we actually had to buy some more Bibles. We got people that are new to us, and they wanted to, even though we're a long ways through, they wanted to catch up, and we're reading every day. And, and uh, how many lost your Bible in March and haven't been catching up with us for a while? There's no condemnation. Amen. Okay. It's good. We're having fun. So we're in the New Testament. We're in the Gospels. And, you know, Jesus is the Father. He is God. Jesus, I mean, Jesus isn't the Father, but he manifests the Father. Jesus, Jesus said, I reveal the Father. He said, if you see me, you see the Father. I mean, Jesus is God. Jesus is perfect theology. If you want to know who God is, get to know Jesus. Jesus fully, absolutely, totally, forensically. God's, God, in Hebrews, the Hebrew writer said, God tried to tell people about himself. He tried to, through the, the prophets and in the Old Testament, he's trying to express himself. But now, he has absolutely, totally made himself clear through Jesus. And as you read the gospel, see Jesus, understand Jesus, and it's a beautiful thing because he is what God is like. A lot of people don't know how to read their Bible property, and they get a, get a lot of funny understandings of who God is. If you got a, something that, that does not it is not, it is causes some kind of, it's a, there's a disconnect between Jesus and whatever you believe about God. Throw that out and just hang on to Jesus. Because what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. And if you got something you believe about God that is not clearly manifest in Jesus, toss it out, please. I allow you to do that. And really just fully, totally embrace the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is perfect theology. All right. So Jesus had his public ministry, and as he ministered, last week we talked about miracles. The week before we talked about the incarnation, and that what an amazing thing that God became flesh means he's never, ever going to leave us. God decided to come into your world, and he will never, ever be removed. God united himself with humanity, and in fact, God, Jesus, is still a man. There's a man on the throne because Jesus has ascended, and he's limited for all eternity to that fact. It's a glorified body nonetheless he there is a human there is a, a man on the throne in glory and what he wants to do is bring many many other sons and daughters to glory that's his whole purpose was to get us to where we could never go so he has done it for us he's made a way he's the new and living way for us to have absolute access and full realization of the eternal purpose of God in our lives that was a lot of stuff right there do you believe that it is the truth, I'm telling you. But Jesus taught. He did a lot of teaching. Now, Mark chapter 3, 34 says, in fact, say in fact. It's a fact. In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. But afterward, he, when he was alone with his disciples, he would explain everything to him. So Jesus never, ever taught publicly without using parables parables. So we read, and you're reading now, you're going to read a lot of parables as we're going through the gospel. What is a parable, pastor? A parable is placing one thing beside another. It's putting something in juxtaposition to another thing. You're putting them side by side because you want to bring clarity to something or to a point. So he put things beside each other. He took practical stories, sometimes often framed as a simile. Next week, we're going to preach on the kingdom of God going to be really good because what was Jesus message he came and he preached everywhere the kingdom of God is within your reach it's here boom come repent because I got good news here's the good news the kingdom is here I have brought the kingdom and I am going to give to you the kingdom of God it is the father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom now, what do you do? You repent. You wallow in self-pity and feel terrible. No, you go, wow, I love that. Repent. I'm going to change my mind, and I'm going to embrace this whole new way of relating to God. So in the Old Testament, repent so God can bless you. In the New Testament, the kingdom is here. God has blessed you. God himself has invaded your situation with his greatness. What do you think of that? Oh, I just myself terrible about it. Are you kidding? Ha ha. Who who? Who knew God was that amazing? Repent. Change your mind from all the other rubbish you believed and embrace the kingdom of God. Amen. 
public ministry, taught with parables, taught about that practical story. It's Matthew 13, eight things where he said, the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. So we see that there were, there were similes. There were uh, parables, things put side by side. What's it like? What's the kingdom like? And he told us what the kingdom was like. So it's often framed in a simile that illustrates a spiritual truth, real simple uh, definition. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, a parable, a parable. Mark L. Bailey, pardon me for the sniffles. I've had a little bit of a battle with a bug, but it's not going to keep me down because I'm a more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Amen. Just don't use this microphone when I'm done. No, I'm kidding. The anointing's crushing stuff right now. <laughs> All right. Boom. Disciples uh, came to him. Mark Bailey, Mark Bailey. Oh, sorry, go back to Mark, Matthew 10, 13. Disciples came and said, why do you speak in parables? He answered them and he said, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So he's speaking in parables because... For those who won't embrace the obvious, he's going to tell stories. For those who won't embrace the obvious, he's going to use parables to answer questions and try to cause some disequilibrium to try to bring them into reality. So he taught with parables uh, to those who weren't embracing the truth. He continued to speak to them in mysteries, trying to draw them. But when you want to know why do you do it, Jesus answered that question himself. Now, Mark L. Bailey said in his guidelines for interpreting parables, he said, Jesus often told parables to answer a question to meet a challenge, or to invite the hearers to change their thinking. To discover the need that prompted the parable is a significant step toward unlocking the meaning with its original context, within its original context. So what's he saying? He's saying that Jesus spoke in parables often, and why he spoke in parables, but if you want to understand how to interpret that parable properly, you need to know why he told the story. And if you don't know why or what it is he's addressing or the question he's answering or the window he's trying to open or the falsehood he's trying to confront, you could misinterpret the parable. So you got to know the context. you got to know what he's addressing if you're going to interpret the parables properly. Mark 4.13, then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the parables? So here's a parable where Jesus is saying this parable is the key to understanding all other parables. So if you don't understand this parable, honestly, don't pass go. Don't move from here. You need to get this. You need to understand what I'm trying to teach you with this parable because this will unlock all the rest of my teaching. So you need to get this parable. He said it under, helps you understand all other parables. What was the parable? The parable was about the seed and the sower. It's the seed and the sower, but the most important thing in the seed and the sower was the soil. So you had seed, sower, and soil. So God is sowing seed. The seed is God's word. God's word is imperishable, incorruptible, will always achieve that for which he sent it. God's word never, ever fails. God's word is loaded with the power. It is sent as a self-seeking missile, and it's packed with achievement to bring about what he sent it for. The only thing is, when it lands, where it hits, it says the soil is your heart. And it says if the soil lands on a heart that's hard, the enemy comes and he picks it up and he takes it away. Boom. He says, wow, they just got seeded with good news today. The buzzards are right at the door. In fact, some buzzards are sitting near you. I don't agree with what the pastor said. <laughs> Not kidding. Happens sometimes. Well, I don't think healing's for everybody. You know, I, I know they believe that, but... <laughs> They're trying to steal your faith. They're trying to rob your hope. They're trying to take away what God has for you. You know, the devil comes, and, and the devil can use your best friend sometimes. Isn't that, isn't that awkward? But, you know, the enemy wants to steal the word from you. And, you know, you, you get a revelation. You take it, and some, some well-meaning brother or sister comes to you, uh, you know, oh, come on, don't get carried away now. Get carried away. God is that good. Turn to your neighbors and say, get carried away. Yeah. So you know what? If your heart's hard, boy, man, the seed can't, can't even, the devil's going to take that. It's got no chance, no chance. So then it says you got the other soil. It says the cares and the worries of the world. You're just, <sighs> seed. <sighs> seed. <sighs> it can't get rooted in your life because you're so freaked out by everything around you. Then you got the other seed. It says it gets choked by the deceitfulness of riches deceitfulness of riches and the cares and concerns about, about your world and these other things creep in. 
Did you not hear, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you? You know, when you put him first, honor him first, boy, you become his responsibility, and he's got a bigger checkbook than you. It's a big deal. But then there's the good soil, right? Good soil is a heart that's wide open, plowed deep, heart that's full of faith, loves him, loves the word, just spend time with him, a heart that's ready, a heart that's standing ready at the gate. Speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. You know, you're just ready to hear from God. It says that heart gets 30, 60, 100-fold returns. So your heart is your hearing mechanism. It says in Romans 10, it says, with the heart you believe and with the mouth you speak unto righteousness. So God's talking to your heart. He speaks to your heart. And so when you, when you keep your heart free of being cluttered up with nonsense, you know, that's why it says, above all else, guard your heart. See, because your heart, that's where all the issues of life, everything comes out of your heart. Is, is it stuff outside of you that makes you, you know, ungodly or wicked? Is it, is it the stuff around? Is it this stuff? No, it's what comes out of you is what comes out of your heart that determines what's going on in your life. So guard your heart, keep your heart, fill your heart with the good things, the word of God. Amen. That's just one of the parables, just bringing that one to light, but important parable because he said, you'll never understand the rest if you don't get that one. So please get that one. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, get it? Got it? Good. All right. Good, good, good. Let's look at another verse. You ready? Uh, Luke, chapter, Luke chapter 18, verse 6 to 8. You ready? Then God said, learn a lesson. Learn a lesson. He told a parable. So he told a parable of an unjust judge and a woman who needed justice. And he said, this woman went to a, what was the judge? Unjust. Okay, so he's telling a story about an unjust judge. Every parable has a principle. But don't try to fit every single person in the parable with somebody you know. Well, the unjust judge represents, you know, Pastor Carl. No. Learn a lesson, a lesson. There's a lesson to learn here, ready? There's an unjust judge. He can give justice, so the woman goes to an unjust judge, and she just wears the guy out, won't leave him alone, just bang, bang, bang. Justice, 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 you can help me, bang, bang, bang. Justice, justice, justice. He finally, not because he could give a rip or cared about her, he finally gave her justice, just get her out of here. So learn the lesson. God's unjust. He's reluctant. He really doesn't want to bless you. But if you'll overcome his reluctance by constantly whining, ah, he'll finally reluctantly bless you. I've heard people preach that nonsense. That's not the lesson. Here's the lesson. Even he, the un even he, even an unjust judge could be overcome by somebody who won't shut up. But listen, so don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him night and day? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them slowly. Sorry? You mean God will answer quickly? I mean, I don't have to beg and plead and, you know, try to wring an answer at him. He'll actually respond. How? How will he respond? Abigail, how will he respond? Quickly. He's not like that other guy. He's a good God. He's a good father. He's a father who loves you. He's the giver of every good gift, the father of lights, and there's no shadow of changing with him. He's full on, full heart, full body in love with you, and he'll answer you quickly. A parable. But, but people... That's why it says the context, the usage, you got to understand it. I've seen people abuse parables for all kinds of nonsense. All right, let's, well, let's look at another one. Luke chapter 10, 25, 37 says, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? Say the law. The law of Moses. Let me ask you a question. How many people in this room are under the law of Moses? Five? Ten, three, not a single one of you are under the law of Moses. Not a single one of you. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law to set you free from the law. In fact, the power of sin is the law. The power of sin is the law. So now Jesus, why is Jesus? Because he's under the law. You have to understand that when you're reading the Gospels, Jesus, until the cross, he was still teaching in an old covenant system. So a lot of his teaching was old covenant principles. 
And a lot of people are mixing up the grace of God with law because they think the, the gospel started with Matthew 1. The gospel is the story about the history of Jesus did, but the good news didn't happen until he was raised up. And he said, hey, everybody, I am who I said I am. And you get the whole thing. Before that, he had to perfectly live under law. And he perfectly taught those under the law. And the only message, they were still under the message, live perfectly and God will accept you. So a lot of the teaching in the Gospels were live per perfectly message. And if you don't understand that, you can preach a lot of mixture and put a lot of people unknowingly and unnecessarily under condemnation. Can I get an amen? Won't happen here. If it does, hit me with a shovel. Please. So Jesus replied, because he comes, teacher. It's a lawyer. It's, a, it's one of the people who really thinks he's pretty good. I'm a good Christian. I'm pretty good compared to you and you and you. I'm pretty awesome. Oh, hey, there's a new teacher in town. Hey, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Whoa, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? Well, the man answered, the law. You're going to hear the law. And what is the law? It's the power of sin. You ready for it? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That gets taught in a lot of New Covenant churches over and over again. And it puts people in bondage. How do I know if I've given them all my heart? All my might. You know, I didn't even want to come to church today, but I came anyway, so I guess that's pretty good. Maybe I'm an 8 out of 10 on the might meter. My mind, my mind wanders when pastor preaches. Maybe I'm not giving him my whole mind. The only way to eternal life is to check all these boxes, and I'm not sure I do all the time. And then when you go neighbor, my neighbors are annoying. You have no idea. I got to love my neighbor. Oh, my goodness. Ah. Give me the next slide. Right. Jesus answered and he said, right. You're right. Why is he right? Because he's under the law. Right, Jesus told him. Then Jesus told him, give that a go. See how it goes for you. Why? You can't do it. So he realizes, oh, um, okay, before I leave, just one more question. Uh, to justify his own actions. Because doesn't the flesh want to justify itself? Is it just me? Is it just me who wants to justify? Is it just me who wants to qualify? Is it just me who wants to check all my boxes and say, I'm a good person? To justify his own actions, he says, oh, 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 oh. And, and who is your neighbor? Hopefully there's a really good answer for this because I don't want to have to love like everybody. I wouldn't want to have to like love my enemies or something like that because that would be awkward. So, who is my neighbor, by the way? And he went, ah, let me tell you a story. So he tells him a story about a good Samaritan. There's a guy who falls in a nasty situation, going down to Jericho. And on that road, the religious guys go by, the Levites, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these people, they don't do a thing for him. In fact, they, they cross over the other way. They get as far away from the mess as they can. Ugh, somebody fell in bad times. Ooh, don't touch that. Because in their culture, if you touch evil, you get evil on you. You see, in our culture, you touch evil, touch evil and you get glory on the evil. See, in, in the new covenant, you can go touch evil stuff and it gets better. So that's why Jesus, he touched a leper. Oh, he touched a leper. It's all right. Well, there's a new kingdom. In the new kingdom, you get to touch bad stuff and it gets good. Really? Yeah, watch this. I'm going to touch a coffin now. I'm going to raise up a dead man. No, not the coffin. No. Oh, wow. That was pretty cool. Under the law, he's got to now go, you know, 20 days in the wilderness for purification. Jesus touched death and he brought life. In the old covenant, he had touched death and you died. Thank God we're under a new covenant. Could I get any believers to live under a new covenant, do you think? Do you think? So these are all awesome parables. He's telling that story. And so the thing is, though, is he makes the hero of the story somebody the Jewish people can't stand. 
I mean, they don't even want to come close to a Samaritan. But Jesus takes a Samaritan who's worse than a foreigner, worse than a Gentile, a Samaritan. I mean, who's a Samaritan in your world? Who's the Samaritan in your life? Because you know what Jesus will do for you? He'll say that I'm going to use the Samaritan to teach you a lesson about the goodness of God. Oh, that, not that person. Oh, no, don't use, oh, not them. Not that group of people. Ooh. Yeah, that group of people. That's who God wants to toss in your face and say, that's your neighbor. <sighs> By this time in the first service, I was finished. But thank God I'm not with you. It's good. Amen. 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 Are you guys thinking on that one still? You're thinking on that one still. All right. All right. So let's go to uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Some other parable. Love these parables. Don't you love these parables? Right? Come on. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Fantastic parables. But let's look at the first word in chapter 15. You ready for the first word? Then, or now, or after that. When I see that, then I want to go, well, after what? I mean, what, what just happened? Because now, see what God does sometimes in his word, like John 3 and John 4, you got a religious guy coming to see Jesus, but then John 4, you got Jesus going to a Samaritan woman. So you got a religious person seeking him at night, and you got a religious person at noonday, Jesus invading their world. And we put these things in contrast with each other because the Bible's trying to teach us stuff. And here's one of those things, John, Luke 15 and Luke 14. The Bible's trying to show you something. And see, Luke 15 starts with then, which means you should have been in Luke 14 first. So in Luke 14, what do we have? Show me Luke 14. What do you got? You got... Luke 14, Jesus is in church that day, and when church ended, one of the chief teachers, the big poopy doos, I mean, one of the big cats, hello, Jesus, I'm having a bunch of my friends over for lunch today after the service. We'd like you to come and spend some time with us. So all the religious folks, all the, all the hoi polloi of their society were coming to the chief Pharisee's place for lunch. So Jesus, whoo, this is so awesome. So Jesus gets there. You can read it for yourself, but here's what happened. Jesus attends knowing that he's hated. He wasn't invited because they liked him. He was invited because you're going to come now into a place where we're going to have our eye on you. We're going to question you. And it's not going to be a happy lunch. It's going to be awkward for everybody. And Jesus said, bring it on. So Jesus walks in. He knows that he's hated. He knows every eye is on him. Have you ever been invited somewhere? And then when you get there, you sit down and you realize, oh, this is a setup. <laughs> so this is actually about me. All right, then. Jesus knew that. He knew that ahead of time. So what's he do? He knows these guys are going to freak out. He sees somebody there, and they've got, uh, what do they call it? Like a goiter? What's the, what's the troopsy? Say droopsy. Does anybody here have a droopsy? It's like a growth. It's like a, a big water growth or something. I, I don't know the medical terms for it, but apparently it's not good. So Jesus sees a guy with not good. And he says, hey, you, boom. And he heals the guy of Droopsy. And he's like, hey, well, was that right? Should I have done that? And they're like, they didn't say a thing. They're just like, <coughs> they're just like, oh, pass the potatoes. <laughs> then, he, then he says, hey, all you guys who showed up early to get the good seats. He says, you know what? In the kingdom, if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. But if you take the good seats, you know what? Foot of pride comes down. Let me tell you something. You ready? God wants to exalt you. Oh, not, no, pastor, I just want to be humble. Just, I just want to be a simple little servant. If you humble yourself and you acknowledge that, you know, I found out that if you trust the Holy Ghost, he can make you look smart. <laughs> I found out that if you just trust God in everything, he can set you up in such an amazing way. I find out if you, if you put yourself to God, you are everything in my life. All that I am, every thought I have, I acknowledge you in all that I do. I have put you first, all was before me. You know what he wants to do? He wants to exalt you. And if he exalts you, nobody can change it. You exalt yourself and ee, kind of scary. It's a lot of work propping up the 
life of pride. Hey, I work hard at this. <laughs> Did you like that? That was good. Did it look good from your angle? All right. So anyway, boom. He, I mean, he's rebuking. the. Then, then he tells his, his the party, the guy who, who's having the party. You can read this all in Luke 14. The guy who holds the party, you know, he's saying, hey, well, at least bless are those who, uh, you know, will be at the great feast in the kingdom. And he said, mm, well, let me tell you a story. He said, there's a, there's a great... A great master of a great banquet, a great banquet, then everything is ready. Everything is there. Healing is there. Blessing is there. Security is there. Identity is there. Prosperity is there. There's nothing missing at the great banquet. Everything you need, the banquet is ready and it's prepared. And he sent out and he said, come to my party. And yet everybody started making excuses. He's talking about these guys. These guys got, Jesus is giving everybody an invitation to life, eternal life. Not life that begins now and is forever, but life that has no beginning and no end. Eternal life, the God kind of life. And these people are all making excuses as to why they don't need to hang with Jesus. He says, so we went into the highways and byways, and he compelled them to come in. Because everything's on the table. Everything you need, it's on the table. It's free to every single person. Just come, just come and enjoy. But you know, people don't want to come and enjoy. They want to deserve it. I want to earn it. But he says it's free. But people wouldn't come. The great almighty God sent his son to tell you that kingdom is here. Everything you need, it's finished, it's done, it's wide open. Come! And then it says he compelled them to come in. And not one of you are here today that he didn't compel you, personally compel you to come. Because it's not even natural to believe that I have to depend on the grace of God. And he has compelled you. He has overcome you to bring you into his family and into his life. I'm going to buy the tape and listen to it again. And literally, he told them, don't miss the party. Because he straight up was telling these guys, I'm not sure you're coming. Now, they're ticked off. He gets up. He's leaving. The whole crowd goes with him. It was this whole crowd, the same religious group of people. They're walking. And here's what he says. Give me another slide. Here's what he says. It's hyperbole. Say hyperbole. Another type of teaching, a figure of speech, a side by side, a parallel. It's a figure of speech in which exaggeration is used as emphasis to affect an extravagant statement. Here's what he says. You ready? 26, 27, 33. Here's what he says. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everybody else. Your mother, your father, brother, sister, you got to hate them if you want to follow me. I get phone calls from people. Is there a pastor there? Can I talk to him? They quote this verse, they say, why would Jesus say that? Why would he want me to hate my family? I said, it's hyperbole. It's a figure of speech. It's a way of teaching. It's a, it's a massive contrast. But he does that because he's, and you have to understand actually who he was saying it to. He was saying to a bunch of religious goody two-shoes who literally is teaching the law. Reframe the law just a little bit because the law says, honor your mother and father and you'll be blessed. But he did something really crazy. He said, hate your mother and your father. He's blowing up these guys' world because these guys are saying, I can be a good disciple. I can do this on my own. I'm a good person. And Jesus is saying, well, let me jack it up and let me put it on steroids for you. If you really want to come after me, every other relationship has to be, in, in comparison, has to be hatred. How many think that's a little intense? Well, he says this, and if you want to come after me, carry your own cross. He hadn't died already. I mean, they weren't reading the New Testament. They didn't even know he was going to die on a cross. So he wasn't saying, you know, follow me, do the cross thing. But they knew people got killed on crosses, people who opposed the Romans, people who stood against that kingdom of that day. So they're like, what, what, is, what are you talking about now? And he's trying to contrast to them that you think that you can stand in your own righteousness. You're ridiculous. Let me, let me take this to a whole other level because you really think somehow in your behavior you can be acceptable to God. So he's jacking it up on steroids. So then in verse 33 he says, you cannot become my disciple without giving away everything you own. Test right now. How many want to be tested? I'm going to test you. Does anybody in this room own anything? Do you own anything? Do you have the deed to anything? Do you have the pink slip for your car in your pocket? You're not a disciple. Give it all to the church before you go, and I'll pray for you. Ha, 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 ha. You wouldn't have liked listening to that either. You would have wondered, like, 
But we will stand in pulpits and we'll preach this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. So get out there, little soldier, and try to be a better Christian. That's not what Jesus was teaching. And so we take the Gospels and the teachings of Jesus. Did you ever go to the Gospels for hope and to feel better and close it and feel condemned? You know why you did? Because you didn't see it through the filter of the cross. You didn't see it through grace, and you probably read a whole bunch of law and legalism, and then you got on the wrong treadmill trying to please a God who's already pleased with you. You're trying to bake cakes he never ordered. It's exhausting. How am I doing? Am I doing all right? Okay. All right, I know that was pretty intense, but I'm, I'm serious about it. It's, it's this, this Bible is an amazing book. And you know, I hear a lot of people say, I believe my Bible on purpose, glory to God. You read it, but you don't even understand it. You're not taking the time to, to really see what's in the word and a lot of us have been taught by people who don't know how to teach the word and yet they got degrees from seminaries who they were professionally taught how to not be able to teach the word well who do you think you are i'm your pastor anointed by the holy ghost to bring revelation to help you walk in the freedom and liberty that Jesus Christ won for you and never to be brought back into the witchcraft of bondage of slavery again Okay, hyperbole. Let's get out of there. Let's get out of there. Let's get out of there fast. Exaggeration for emphasis. That's what it was. And yet we preach it like, I believe every word of it. Praise the Lord. Jesus placed celebration above tradition. Religion practiced the discipleship of separation. Jesus practiced the discipleship of association. Jesus built redemptive relationships. He went where the people were. He approached everyone. So here's, this was Jesus. Now he's walking with the same crowd he had dinner with. Same group. And I can show it to you, the crowd, study the crowd. It's the same verse that was used. He was at a banquet with the crowd, same crowd. So he's with that crowd. We looked at the first verse in, in Luke 15. It says, then, then. So he's coming with that crowd. He's talking to them. And then it says, here comes the sinners. And here's a group has their own total classification. They're not just sinners. They're their own class of sinners, tax collectors. Make sure you vote. I think it's this week or something like that. So anyway. You got sinners in that. So what does that tell you? Everything he taught in chapter 14 had nothing to do with talking to brokenhearted people who need help. He was speaking to self-righteous do-gooders in a very awkward and uncomfortable situation. But now, say, thank you, Jesus. He's talking to the people who say, hey, I could use some help over here. The sinners in the doctor, oh, Jesus, where you been? Hey, he's like, oh, I see dinner with these cats. Oh, my God. Anyways, so he comes, and then these guys are like, oh, look. Look, he, look at him. Look at him. You know, he, he spends that time with us, and now, look, he's happy to be with these sinners, these wicked people. Look at him, and Jesus knew it was in their heart. So because he knew it was in their heart, because of their attitude, the religious people, he told these three stories. So these parables are told right when Jesus came out of a very awkward situation with a whole group of religious folks. Context. Boom. Give me another slide. Grace supplies law demands. If you're feeling a demand put on you, it's not grace. If you're feeling something flowing out of your life, a passion and desire to do righteousness because you're a slave to righteousness, that's the grace of God. Because the grace of God doesn't just tell you there's something to do, it empowers you to do it. And the grace of God will deliver you from sin. It'll deliver you from every awkward thing in your world everything. Law keeping leads to more sin. Because law demands, but grace supplies. Law demands righteousness, but grace supplies righteousness. So law says, I will by no means be clear. I will not clear the guilty. I will visit their iniquity on their fathers to the third and the fourth generation. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Law. But grace says, I'll be merciful to their iniquity and their sins. Their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. How many want to live on the grace side? Amen. All right, give me another slide because I'm coming to a rapid conclusion. John 6, 63 to 69. The Spirit alone, George, these, these tall branches, they're in the way of my reading. <laughs> I have to move all the way over here to see the slide. 
I'm going to get, a, get my hedge trimmers out and give them a cut. <laughs> the Spirit alone gives eternal life. Hello! The Spirit alone gives eternal life, the God kind of life. It comes from the Spirit. The Spirit, the Word, the letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. The Spirit alone brings life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. Sorry. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? A sacred cow. We love keeping those things alive. The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you don't believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning those which would come to believe, he even knew the one who would betray him. Then he said, this is why I said that people can't come after me unless the Father gives them to me. So what brings life? The Spirit. What does all your behavior modification do? Nothing. What will, what will change your behavior? The grace of God. And if it's not God, then it's works of the flesh, and none of us will be justified by works of the flesh. None of us. But some people don't believe grace works. Some people believe that big, strong, stuck in Adam, ooh, you're in Adam. Can you do anything if you're in Adam? Nothing. You can't get yourself out. God gets you out, and he puts you in Christ. Now, Adam was a strong grip. Ooh, I was in Adam, and I couldn't get myself out. But then you get in Christ, but in Christ is fragile. You can fall out all the time. You can fall out of Christ. Ooh, I was in Christ. Oop, slipped out. Oop, oop, had a bad day. Ooh, but Adam, ooh, powerful grip. You're in Adam. You're stuck. Do you know what? The Bible says that the grip of being in Christ is much more powerful than the grip of Adam. You've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. You've been brought into the kingdom of light. And nothing can take you out. And you didn't put yourself in. He did it. And you're firm in that grip forever. That's why he contrasted it between it, Adam and Christ. There's only two places to be. And the only way to get in Christ is by faith. Wow, this is good, Pastor. Please, hold your applause. I'm so serious about this stuff. That's why I'm thankful. Because I know what I can do. It's nothing. But you know what I know what he can do with nothing? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But you know why the first rung on the ladder is blessed are the poor in spirit? Because you don't even start until you realize I can't do a stinking single thing for myself. That's the starting point. Boom. You got to just say, help me. He exalts the humble and he loves doing it. All right. And the very words that I've spoken, da, da, da. give me the next slide. Right? At this point, many of his people who were just kind of checking him out turned away and deserted him. What happened here? What happened here? What happened here? Many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and he said, you guys want to check out too? Because it's a good time if you want to. Because you see, with Jesus, it's easy to come and it's easy to leave. But the 12 turned around. Peter said, Lord, where would we go? I mean, to whom would we go? I mean, Peter said, you have the words that give eternal life. Huh? See, these people were like, you can't do it on your own. It's only the Spirit. Oh, wow. I don't like that message. <laughs> I was really enjoying hanging with Jesus. Disciples. Disciples are people who are following learners. They're learners, intent learners, devout learners. But you just see, God's not looking for disciples. He's looking for sons and daughters. He's looking for sons and daughters who have disciplined lives. And disciple, there's nothing wrong with discipleship at all. But if you have discipleship without sonship, you got a problem. If you have discipleship without, discipleship without faith that you are who he says you are, you got a problem. If you elevate discipleship over sonship, you have a problem. They deserted him, and Jesus said to the 12, are you going to go too? And Simon Peter said, Lord, where are we going? I mean, you got the words of life. We believe. Say, we believe. 
We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Who is the Holy One of God? He's the one who deals with everything that you couldn't do for yourself. And he's the one who finished the work completely. And all you have to do is believe. Believe. And I'm just about done. Are you ready? I think I got one more scripture. Two more slides, one more scripture. Luke 15, Jesus, he'll go after the one. That's what he wanted to say. He goes to these broken, hurting people. Hey, guys, let me tell you a story. You know what? If there was just one of you, Jesus would go after you. He'd, he'd turn away. He'd leave the 99. He'd go after you hardcore. And do you know how the lost sheep got found? He didn't do a single thing. He got found. He was lost. He picked them up. And he, oh, Jesus, bah, I repent for getting lost. No, he just, boom. He didn't put himself on Jesus' shoulders. He didn't bah loud enough in the thicket to finally get caught. Jesus sought him out and found him because it's all about him. The coins, 10 coins in, in the Jewish culture, these 10 coins with a woman recognized, it was like a, a symbol of purity. If you lost one of the coins, oh no, the, but what do the coins have? They have an image. And what is the Holy Spirit going to do? And many say these parables are Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. And what is the Holy Spirit going to do? What's begun in you, he's going to complete. The purity that's been imparted to you, he's going to bring it into manifestation. He is going to fully bring out the image of Christ in your life. He's going to do it. And then the last one, I love it, don't you? The son stole, didn't steal, but he said, Dad, give me my inheritance, bye-bye. He goes, he blows it all, he's in a pig pen. He's eating pig stuff, and he finally comes to a sense, he says, even servants, servants, servants with my father are better off than I am. I'm going to go back to him and see if he'll let me be a slave. So he goes back, he's rehearsing, you know, I can't believe I did what I did, I'm so sorry, could I at least be a slave? He's rehearsing the whole thing, he's rehearsing, he's rehearsing, then his father comes running, he sees his son, and he grabs him, he's about to give him a hug, he says, you smell like a pig! What have you done with yourself? I told you, get in there, clean yourself up, and we're going to have a conversation. That's not what happened. Father said, don't even say a word. My son who was lost is found. And what do I get now? Well, if you're a good boy for a while, I'll give you a new set of clothing. And if you're good for a little while longer, I'll put sandals on your feet. And if you keep on being good, you know what? You're going to progress to where I might even give you the ring back. No, he said, get the ring, get the clothes, get the sandals, kill the fatted calf. My son is home. What's Jesus trying to show? He's trying to show these religious people as he talks to these broken people. Because these guys can't believe he's that kind of people who I believe are undeserving. But he loves us so much. All right, I'm just about done because I think there's only one more slide. I hope, I hope, I hope. I hope. We've been able to go from heart to heart, not head to head. Hope we haven't been having arguments in your head, but hope we've been having a life touch in your spirit. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and he begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you. Here's what the son who stayed home said. Here's what the son who lived the perfect upright life said. Here's the son who says, I've been doing for you. I've been doing another day of doing good for you, father. How did I do? You know what the father said? You're no fun. Everything I have is yours. We could have thrown a party any time, but son, you're always working for me, working for me. Here's how the son flamed, here's how the son framed his life in his father's home. All these years I've slaved for you. All these years I've slaved for you. And now when my brother comes back who spent everything, you're going to throw a party for him? You never threw a party for me. I could never find you, son. Every time I wanted to have a conversation, you wrote, I'm doing something for you, dad. My son who was lost is found. You know what? You should be in here partying with him. The only one who never made it to the party in the end was the self-righteous brother. And that was the whole parable. Jesus told the parable because he had all these self-righteous people who couldn't believe that he's hanging out with these people in need. Anybody in need today? Is there anybody here in need today? Anyone? I am. I live in my head. I live in my world. I don't know about you, but I need him. You know what's even more important to me needing him? I want him every day of my life. 